Hello and welcome to another Gad About United video. In the last week, over a three day period, we all went through the whole gamut of emotions, disbelief, shock, anger, desperation, but fortunately, finally, and for now, relief. That's what the announcement of a European Super League that spits not only on our club, but our games heritage will do to you. And unsurprisingly, with our club owners as one of the instigators. However, this shouldn't be much of a surprise, should it? The biggest clubs of Europe have been talking about this since the 90s. As the Americans might say, it's a can that has been kicked down the road for a while now. That is until the greed of these 12 really came to the fore, behind the backs of their managers, players, fellow clubs and football organisations, but most importantly the fans. Due to the management of clubs like Real Madrid, who today, whilst all of the English participants have already pulled out some days ago, their president, Florentino Perez, isn't letting go. It's the only thing that he sees will save his club, and it looks like he'll try and sue those teams that have seen the light and pulled out to do it. As far as United are concerned, I hope the Glazer family finally understand that this is never going to happen. And whilst these wretched people defile our club, holding it to ransom, they finally understand that they went too far and will now sell up. However, in this video, I don't want to talk about what will happen next. I want to talk about how on earth we got here, because this didn't happen overnight. The chipping away at our club identity, tradition, history and finally financial security didn't start with them, but I sincerely hope it will finish with them. Our club in its 143rd year of being has had a glorious if not checkered history, but we've met financial adversity head on before. From the January 1902 winding up order with debts piled up when we were called Newton Heath, being saved by four local businessmen including John Henry Davis who then later became president, to a generation later when in the lean years of the 1920s and 30s for the Reds, after John Henry Davis died, the club's finances deteriorated to such an extent that Manchester United would have likely gone bankrupt had it not been for James W. Gibson, who, in December 1931 with an investment of his own money, saved and assumed control of the club. On a personal note, James W. Gibson should be the name that all Manchester United fans should remember. This man did more for us than any other player or manager. Without him we would not have Busby, Fergie, the Holy Trinity or the treble success. He is the anti-glazer. Since the war United have generally been debt free and over the last 70 plus years we've seen more highs than lows. However, as Alex Ferguson, once he got going, started to sweep all before him in the early 90s, even then it was starting to go wrong on the non-football side. But bathed in the warm embrace of domestic and European glory, we were too blind to see it. And to be honest, only a few of us heeded the warning signs. In the same year that we won the European Cup Winners' Cup for the first time, in 1991, the club became a PLC, which was designed to generate a lot more money for the club, but it came with a massive flaw. It could also let in a family of rats in at the back door to gorge themselves on the club's wealth with no regard for what Manchester United Football Club stands for. The inception of the Premier League starting in the 92-93 season was yet another way to bring in revenue, especially through television. The club's success on the pitch with league titles and on the rare occasion runners-up finishes meant a greater slice of the B Sky B TV money pie. But even then the broadcasters were taking control out of the hands of football clubs and the FA for this price. With the new concept of Monday Night Football, the commercialism of America was already been sewn into the fabric of our game, and the disgruntled protests at no longer having 3pm Saturday kickoffs was quickly muted. However, I'm not against capitalism. A number of clubs over the years have gone out of business or have had close shaves due to financial mismanagement. Extra revenue streams are important and vital. However, it's all well and good to fill in the coffers with this money and give the manager the funds to literally buy any player he wishes or being able to increase the size of the capacity of Old Trafford again and again and again. But there was one commercially led move, the removal of the Golden Words Football Club from the club badge in 1997 that should have garnered far more opposition than it did. A full eight years before the Americans got their hands on our beloved Manchester United Football Club, the people who ran it in the 90s no longer considered it a football club, or at least saw it as a limiting factor not worthy of our brand logo. We got our first warning shot of what was to come in 1998, as amoral billionaire media mogul Rupert Murdoch made an audacious bid for the club. Thankfully, a new group, the Shareholders Against Murdoch, now known as the Manchester United Supporters Trust, lobbied shareholders to block such a takeover, 
and thanks to them and the Monopolies and Mergers Commission, they were successful as Murdoch's bid foundered. As demonstrated with Murdoch, the problem going forward was that as a PLC, whilst United reaped the benefits of additional revenue, and lots of it, they were unfortunately susceptible to bids from literally anyone. There was no new owner scrutiny by the FA in those days, nor the same rule that was implemented by a far-sighted German FA in that year, 1998, where any football club that became a PLC and then was bought by an investor had to have 50% plus one share remain for the parent club. But I've been remiss and not mentioned other potential bullets dodged before PLC status. Capsized millionaire crook Robert Maxwell tried to buy United in the 80s, but fortunately couldn't stump up the cash. And then there was the clownish bid by millionaire businessman Michael Knighton, who also didn't have the funds to back up meeting the £20 million plus asking price by the club at the start of the 89-90 season. Also, if you think back, there were other signs around this time that we were losing the club as we knew it. Ticket prices vastly increased after United went public in 91. As you can see, using the information from the red11.org website, prices more than doubled from 1991 to the 94-95 season. That's just four years. In the 10 years since United was open to all to be invested in, which was supposed to give fans a chance to own part of their club, but mainly to raise revenue, the real fans that had been going for decades now had to fork out three times what they did in 91, for single and for some types of season tickets. The core support now couldn't afford to go, but there were plenty of voyeurs or day tripper fans willing to fill the void. It was eventually voiced to the rest of the country that real United fans were being priced out. In the year 2000, this changing demographic of stadium support triggered criticism from United captain Roy Keane, who targeted certain section of fans during a European tie for their lack of vocal support, giving us a new term, the Prawn Sandwich Brigade, referring to fans who weren't there to support the team, but for the experience of going to a Manchester United game as if it was fashionable especially for the corporate or hospitality side. For posterity, his exact quote was, Away from home, our fans are fantastic. I'd call them the hardcore fans. But at home, they have a few drinks and probably the prawn sandwiches, and they don't realise what's going on out on the pitch. This was the changing face of football, but nothing was being done to reward or cater to loyal, often local fans who had been priced out by that time. Focusing on the aforementioned day tripper fans, who often come from outside the country, even Europe, and at most once a year, or even just once in their lifetime, will spend a lot on the day, on all sorts of merchandise at the club shop, programmes, or even taking a tour the day before. These fans have been given ticket preferences over UK-based fans for around two decades now, to my knowledge. The rest of us eventually found out last week that we would be segmented into the Glazer Revenue Stream insultingly as legacy fans. Compared to other top flight clubs, as you can see here for prices shown for the 2018-19 season, United were priced right in the middle in 10th spot for the most expensive tickets available, with the three big London clubs being far more expensive. But what's more disturbing is that we're in 16th spot for the cheapest possible tickets, more than three times the price of Liverpool's cheapest offering at just £9. The demographic shift of long-serving fans going to matches versus day-tripper fans can only be rectified with allocation and pricing reforms that the Glazers will never be willing to implement. All of these financial implications and vulnerabilities were finally brought to the fore in the early noughties, and the catalyst for this was the personal feud between the boss, Sir Alex Ferguson, and his horse racing partners, John Magnier and J.P. McManus, over the stud rights of a horse they owned together, Rock of Gibraltar. This feud became very personal, as these two majority shareholders at Man United at the time tried to remove Fergie as manager. With the board siding with Fergie, Malcolm Glazer, a US businessman, exploited the situation to launch a takeover bid. Glazer acquired these crucial shares from Magnier and McManus, who were happy to sell. This acquisition allowed Malcolm Glazer, through his investment vehicle Red Football Limited, at least he knew the colour we play in, to acquire the club by leveraging the remaining necessary share purchase and saddling it with a massive debt, £540 million at the time, at an interest rate of between 7-20% to per annum, as he had loans with various institutions. Despite the protests, and some years later, a failed takeover bid by the Red Knights, a consortium of wealthy United fans purportedly with the club's best interests at heart, supported by most United fans, unfortunately came to nothing. Today the Glazer family, now just the sons of the family patriarch Malcolm, who passed away in 2014, 
splitting his 90% stake in United equally between his six children, are in control. The final result of all these takeover bids was the culmination of this, almost worst case scenario, an absentee owner of Manchester United draining its resources, not caring about whether the team won or lost, or having an interest in the fans, history or culture of the club in particular, or soccer in general. The main defiant response came from long-serving United supporters themselves, some of them founded FC United of Manchester. More political fan protests have continued, with the use of the club's old green and gold colours, worn when Manchester United were Newton Heath, and sported recently, a century after, in the 1992-93 season, as a commemorative third strip, show this renewed enough is enough stand from the mounting army of fans. However, the effectiveness of both powerful statements of fan dissatisfaction and anger still has done little to oust the Glazer family from Old Trafford so far, but the movement is growing stronger and fierier since the Super League debacle. And that brings us up to today, to the mess we're in now, to the culmination of the massive avarice of 12 football club owners and presidents, including our own, who think they can offset the debts of their mismanaged football clubs with even greater revenue streams, or just take it out in dividends. The club, now valued at over £3 billion, making it almost impossible to purchase, still isn't enough for the Glazer family. Apart from the debt that they still have United in, to the tune of hundreds of millions of pounds, they want reputedly a £4 billion payoff for their club. Our club. For those of you who have reached this far into the video, I thank you, but I ask you to indulge me a little longer. There are still other ways the club is losing out. As a massive revenue generator across the world, according to the official website, Manchester United have 23 official global partners and another 30 odd at least smaller regional financial and media partners and many other small advertisers. But all of this perceived revenue comes at a price. Pimping out your club to all and sundry devalues it morally and cheapens the founding principles of shockingly playing football. I wouldn't mind as much if it weren't for the fact that we still have hundreds of millions of pounds worth of debt that doesn't seem to ever go down. There seem to be insufficient funds to back the manager, whoever he is, and we have been uncompetitive in the transfer market for years. Old Trafford is in disrepair, rusting, unpainted, leaking. Basic maintenance needs to be addressed and shouldn't be an afterthought. That's why it's basic. It should be done as standard, and it's not. The disinterest from the Glazer family, just raking in the cash and taking now almost £2 billion out in club dividends, means that these exclusive deals go to fund their personal excesses, not the club's needs. As Gary Neville notably said recently, they never say or put the name to anything. That's why he was so worried when Joel Glazer made the Super League statement of intent. There's never been any fan interaction. As with Barcelona, Real Madrid and others, the mismanagement of these clubs meant that the Super League avarice was inevitable. I, like most Reds, were relieved and hope the Glazers see their financial limitations in whoring the club out to satisfy their every whim as being the final straw. To be honest, some of these issues is not just the United problem. The whole game is now about advertising. Soon our beloved shirts will be like Formula One driving suits, with scores of small and large sponsors adorning it. I remember not that long ago when football shirts came out every two years. Not every year. And not special editions every other year. And they were reasonably priced. United fans before my time can attest to five or seven years before a brand new strip design was seen. The whole world of football is one I don't recognise anymore, and equally don't like. So what now? How do we combat this? Obviously we need to get the Glazers out. That's universally agreed upon. I'm personally not going to tell you what to do, but I can make suggestions. Cancel your subscriptions to MUTV, and don't buy club merchandise. Hit the Glazers where it hurts. In the pocket. I wouldn't suggest you boycott games or not watch United anymore. Instead, sport the green and gold colours at games, peaceful protests, or whenever you can on social media. Support FC United of Manchester. They deserve your support. They are the embodiment of the anti Glazer defiance. While most of the rest of us imbibed the success on the pitch and thought nothing was wrong, we were still winning after all, with superb teams. They saw the writing on the wall and they set up a rival club as a sign something to follow. The most important thing though is to get behind the German 50 plus 1 model mentioned earlier. Many Reds are passing around social media a petition to be signed for the government to discuss changing the law. 
However, in 1998, it was the German FA themselves that made the rule change, not the German government. In my opinion, if anyone should be petitioned, it should be the English FA. They have the power. They have the money for legal action if the Glazers and others, like Abramovich, don't like it. And the real interest to change the laws to save our heritage. I don't trust any politician to address this problem once the Super League business has died down and is forgotten, as it won't win them votes and there's limited popularity points to be gained from the subject. So that was the journey to the point we're at right now, a crossroads for the future of Manchester United. Have you got anything to add? Is there anything I missed? And what will you do going forward? Please comment below and like, share and subscribe. Thank you for your support.